If there's one thing we love here at Team Triple Jump, it's looking back into the past and reminiscing about all of the great games that give us warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feelings. Sadly, Adam says we're not allowed to have fun all the time, and so occasionally we have to punish ourselves by looking back at some of the tosh that the games industry has churned out in years past. We've already tortured our writers by making them dig through the cesspool that is the worst games of the 21st century so far. Please go and check that video out if you haven't already. But frankly, we think there's far more abhorrence out there, so we're going to look back even further. For this list then, we're taking a look at the most terrible video games that came out at any point in the 20th century. Just please don't expect another one of these videos, sadly they weren't making many video games in the 1800s. I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and here are the 10 worst games of the last century. Number 10. Pac-Man for the Atari 2600 you might not have thought it possible to get a game as simple as Pac-Man wrong. After all, the only thing players want from the flappy-headed yellow hockey puck is for him to gobble up dots and avoid ghosties. Turns out, though, you'd be wrong, because the Atari 2600 port of the arcade favourite, Pac-Man, was an utter shambles. Unfortunately for the kiddies who purchased Pac-Man for the 2600, hoping it would save them from feeding their pocket money into arcade machines, the port was forced to scale down the game's technical features due to the limitations of the hardware. Players found that the graphics had gotten a serious downgrade, the maze layout had changed, and the ghosts flickered, not in an ominous or spooky way, but due to the fact that the 2600 could only render one on screen at any one time. The poor quality of Pac-Man was a contributing factor to the crash of 1983, as consumers' faith in the video games industry was at an all-time low, and along with a number of other Atari games, more on that later, uns sold copies were buried in the New Mexico desert in the hopes that no one would ever have to experience them ever again. <laughs> Number 9. Night Trap in recent years, interactive movie video games have become fairly common, with the likes of Dwayvid Quage frequently churning out titles that favour player choices over player actions. Back in 1992, however, it was basically unheard of, so in that sense, Night Trap did break some new ground, so whilst it's definitely not the best game in the world, it could be argued that it paved the way for bigger and better things. Although Night Trap aimed to deliver the kind of B-movie experience that was prevalent in a lot of teen horror films at the time, once players got past the novelty of the game's style, they found that it really didn't have all that much to offer. The actual interactive element of Night Trap ultimately came down to pressing a single button at the right moment, which is fine to do every so often. I mean, heck, a great deal of modern games employ the QTE mechanic to this day. However, when it's all there is, it gets old pretty quickly quickly. As forgettable as the gameplay was though, Night Trap's violent themes did court enough controversy to gain the attention of the United States Senate, and along with Mortal Kombat, it contributed to the creation of the ESRB. Still, I suppose being infamous is better than not being remembered at all. <laughs> Number 8. Mortal Kombat Mythologies Sub-Zero Back in 1996, someone at Midway had the idea to make a Mortal Kombat that wasn't a fighting game. What's even weirder is that several people thought it was a good idea, put it into development, and gifted the world with Mortal Kombat Mythologies Sub-Zero. Spoiler alert, it was not a good idea. You're joking. Oh, for God's sake, I can't honestly- A spin-off of the main Mortal Kombat series, Mythology Sub-Zero is set before the original 1992 game and joins Bi-Han on his quest to find Shinnok's amulet. The game plays similarly to the other entries in the franchise in terms of its controls, but unfolds in the style of an action-adventure title. The most notable criticism levelled at Mythology Sub-Zero is that it just isn't all that much fun, and whilst the RPG element 
elements were executed in an alright manner, the rest of the gameplay comes down to fighting copy-paste enemies and dying in unpredictable traps. It also suffered from that old chestnut, unresponsive controls, and struggled greatly in the camera department, with players finding that very often they just have to jump blindly into the beyond on account of the fact that they just couldn't see where they were going. Oh, and there are scarcely any fatalities either, so for that reason alone, we're out. Number 7. Rap Jam Volume 1 if you're going to give your game the subtitle Volume 1, you'd better make sure that it doesn't completely suck, because players are going to infer your intent to make a sequel and wonder why your lofty ambitions were so poorly executed. Such was the reality for 1995's Rap Jam Volume 1, a sports title that pits rappers against each other in a series of basketball games. Players can choose from the likes of LL Cool J, Coolio, and Queen Latifah before getting out on the court and shooting some oops. As interesting as the premise of Rap Jam Volume 1 is, sadly the gameplay was awful, and critics felt that the game fell short in a lot of other areas. Whilst the graphics on the menu screens were alright, the in-game visuals were so poor that it was hard to tell the players apart. The same goes for the sound, because the setup menus laid down some fat beats that's fat with a ph, but that all stopped as soon as gameplay began. Even if you could look past all that though, Rap Rap Jam just didn't play very well in general, with reviewers criticising the unresponsive controls that made the game almost impossible. I think the lesson to be learned here is that we should all stick to what we're best at, so we recommend that rappers stay in the recording studio and leave the sports to, uh, <laughs> the professionals, you know, like me. Here I go! <laughs> Number 6. The Crow City of Angels there's arguably nothing worse in the gaming industry than titles that are just a shameless cash grab, and no game screams I'm just trying to get more of your money because you liked the movie than 1997's The Crow City of Angels. Based on the film of the same name, players jump into the shoes of a mechanic, Ash Corvan, as he is resurrected and seeks revenge against those who murdered him and his son, including the drug king Judah and the quote ninjutsu death bitch Kali. Although the visuals were praised by critics owing to the 3D rendered backgrounds that were at the time pretty much cutting edge, this couldn't save the game from an absolute lambasting in other areas. Reviewers were particularly upset with the controls, which they found to be unresponsive, making it tricky to get your character to do what you wanted them to do. They also admonished the fixed camera angles that changed too frequently, making the game even more difficult to play. It was also mocked for its terrible voice acting, unintentionally hilarious dialogue, and over-exaggerated animations. Thankfully, City of Angels was the first and last time that the Crow franchise has dipped its toe into the video gaming pool and we pray that this time it stays dead. Number 5. Friday the 13th when you think of Jason Voorhees, your mind probably goes to that massive machete or the smorgasbord of squishy teenagers he's brutally murdered over the years. Ah, your mind probably doesn't go to this scotch tape looking madness from 1989. Or at least I certainly hope it doesn't. Or if it does, well, you have my sympathies. Friday the 13th has players take on the role of camp counsellors who must defeat Jason before he kills them or the children that they're looking after. The game was universally panned, not only for its bizarre aesthetic choices which turned Jason into a purple and turquoise nightmare, but also for its technical limitations which, above all else, made it insanely difficult. Perhaps its worst crime though is that it just wasn't scary. Admittedly, we can also look back on the Friday the 13th movies with little discomfort these days, but at the time, audiences actually found them to be quite frightening, which is why the video game adaptation was was such a disappointment. Fortunately, the good people at Ilphonic have since developed Friday the 13th The Game, which players found to at least capture the spirit of the films that inspired it. It's just a shame it took nearly 30 years for a developer to make a half-decent Jason Voorhees game, and I only hope that the 1989 version doesn't come back from the dead another 12 times. You know, like, like Jason did. They, they keep making them, don't they? 
Number 4. The Philips CDI Legend of Zelda Games There are some out there who theorize that the cutscenes featured in the Legend of Zelda releases for the Philips CDI are the reason that Link is now a silent protagonist, and having watched them back, we can definitely see why they'd think that. Following a deal they made with Philips to produce a CD-ROM add-on for the SNES, which incidentally never came to light, Nintendo gave Philips the license to use five of their characters for games for the CDI. This is what led to the development of Link the Faces of Evil, Zelda the Wand of Gamelon, and Zelda's Adventure. None of these titles had much in the way of involvement from Nintendo, and oh boy, does it show. There's Drolik round the side of Glutgo. I... At the time of release, critics weren't too harsh on the games. However, looking at them through a modern lens and comparing them to the likes of the infinitely superior Ocarina of Time or Breath of the Wild, that position has largely shifted. The main concern is leveled at the aforementioned bizarre cutscenes, which have now been heavily memeed owing to the unsettling animation and awful voice acting. Golly! Considered to be the worst entries in the franchise, Nintendo refused to acknowledge these titles as part of the Zelda timeline, insisting that they are their own self-contained canon and nothing to do with the series that we know and love today. That's probably it's probably the right line to take. Yeah. I won. Number 3, Custer's Revenge. Fair warning, viewers, we'll be touching on subjects here that some of you might find uncomfortable, namely sexual violence against Native American women, so please do skip ahead to the next entry if you need to. Timestamp on screen. We like to think we're not too easily offended here at Team Triple Jump. After all, we've enjoyed many a game over the years that has courted controversy for one reason or another. We don't mind the blood and viscera of Mortal Kombat, and we can appreciate the tongue-in-cheek nature of South Park The Stick of Truth. Custer's Revenge, however, takes the cake when it comes to being utterly reprehensible. Released in 1982, the game came sealed in a package that stated, Not for sale to my and carried the hefty price tag of $50, which, adjusted for inflation, is about $135 today. So, before even playing the game, audiences knew something was up. Upon finding out what the game entailed, though, i.e. the sexual assault of Native American women, the world was rightly outraged, with critics calling it an affront to common decency, and many women's rights groups and Native American spokespeople calling for it to be banned. Despite its deplorable nature, though, Custer's Revenge still sold over 80,000 copies before it was finally pulled from circulation seven months after its release. We're just grateful that the game is so mercifully old and low-res that you can't really see what's going on most of the time. Number 2. Superman The New Superman Adventures Although many of us might look back with fond nostalgic feelings at Superman The New Superman Adventures, also known colloquially as Superman 64, it really isn't and never was a good game. In fairness to it, though, it was rather well received by its target audience, i.e. children between the ages of 6 and 11, but <laughs> what the heck do they know? Set in a virtual reality recreation of Metropolis created by Lex Luthor, it's up to Supes to save his friends from the clutches of his biggest adversary. You know, if he's able to navigate all of the fog that's definitely there for plot reasons, and not just to cover up the game's rubbish draw distance. Sadly, the development of the game was hampered by tensions between developer Titus Interactive and licensers Warner Brothers and DC Comics, meaning that many of the developer's ideas were shut down or changed last minute, leaving little time to polish the gameplay. This meant that when it released, Superman 64, or according to the back of the box, the new Superman Aventures, was a bit of a mess, with critics panning the game for its unresponsive controls, glitches, and the generally repetitive nature of its gameplay. Yes, ring levels, we're looking at you. You suck, and we hate you. And number one, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. What else could take the top spot in the game that almost killed the entire industry, was partially to blame for the crash of 83, and was so bad that it was, as we've already mentioned, buried in the desert? 
Indeed, the entire story of E.T. the Extraterrestrial is a cautionary tale. Following the success of the movie, the CEO of Atari's parent company decided it would be a great idea to develop a game about the telephone-obsessed alien. Once the rights were acquired at the end of July 1982, a single programmer was told the game had to be ready no later than September the 1st in time for Christmas. In terms of premise, players were put in control of the titular E.T. and expected to find pieces of a phone so that he could, <laughs> you guessed it, phone home. Even prior to development, Steven Spielberg expressed reservations about this, lamenting that they weren't doing something more similar to Pac-Man. Regardless, development went ahead anyway, and the game was absolutely slaughtered by critics. Due to this and one or two other factors, Atari as a company was reduced simply to Atari Games, its arcade game development division, and the games industry itself took a nosedive, leaving behind nothing but a whole load of unsold copies of E.T. and a horror story that still haunts developers to this very day. 